Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Sun. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a principal in the investment team at Collar Capital based in New York. Let me start by thanking you for making the time to join us for our Barometer webinar. On behalf of everyone at the firm, I hope that you and your families are keeping well as we continue to navigate these unprecedented times. I'm joined today by one of my colleagues, Katrina Liao, an investment principal based in London. And together, we will present the results of our latest barometer. Throughout the session, you will have the opportunity to submit questions. You can do so by using the Ask a Question button, and we will follow up with you with the responses. For those of you who are new to our publication, Collar Capital's Global Private Equity Barometer is a unique snapshot of worldwide trends in private markets. It's a twice a year overview of the plans and opinions of institutional investors based in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. The 35th edition of the barometer captures the view of 102 private equity investors from around the world. They were surveyed over a six week period between 28th of September and the 9th of November, 2021. Its findings are globally representative of the LP population by location, type of organization, total AUM, and length of private equity investing experience. And the results show investors view private equity and private markets in a positive light, and they also show markets that are developing rapidly. With that, let's turn to the findings. One question we ask LPs in this edition is what is the likely effect of incentivizing a larger proportion of portfolio company employees on PE's overall returns? Offering stock options and including a wide pool of employees in profit sharing are not new mechanisms, but one that has not been widely used by general partners in their portfolio companies. There have been some examples of GPs changing their approach and being more inclusive, such as KKR, which has led to positive results, such as increased retention of portfolio company employees and improved productivity. We asked LPs for their views on this type of model, and almost half of LPs thought that offering performance-based incentives to a larger proportion of portfolio company employees would, over time, improve private equity's investment returns. The benefits of private markets ownership is a topic on which LPs have strong views. As a business goes through its development cycle, there are times when a different ownership model makes sense according to the LPs we surveyed. Almost all LPs believe that most small and mid-cap companies listed on public stock exchanges would benefit from periodic ownership by private equity firms as they evolve and grow. Sometimes it can be beneficial for a business to have professional and supportive owners that help the business grow away from the scrutiny of the public markets so the management team can focus on medium to long-term plan rather than quarterly reporting. On the flip side, there are other times when a company can benefit from the access to liquidity, more transparent valuations, and corporate governance best practices they can derive from listing on the public markets. In any case, having private equity sponsorship for when private companies list on public markets is viewed as a positive indicator in assessing the short to medium term prospects of private companies. And there is some evidence to back up these views. Here, you can see a chart that shows the 12 month return for PE back IPOs versus traditional IPOs. According to research, PE backed IPOs have outperformed traditional IPOs by more than 5% in the 12 months post the public listing, especially in periods of market consolidation. One of the more recent developments in private markets has been the rapid growth of continuation funds. Although what we call the GP-led secondaries market has been around for many years, indeed, Collar Capital was one of the first to work with GPs on this type of transactions, 
the growth we have seen in recent years has been extremely fast. A compound average growth rate of 45% per annum over the period from 2015 to the first half of 2021. GP-led secondaries are expected to represent half of all secondary transactions in 2021, and on Caller Capital's estimates, that makes it a $50 billion market, as we are forecasting the total market to hit $100 billion of volume this year. Almost all of the GP-led transactions are continuation funds. This type of structure is where there is a transfer of assets from an existing fund, typically when it's nearing the end of the fund life, into a new vehicle normally managed by the same GP with funding from a secondary investor. Existing investors have the option to roll into the new vehicle or exit their position and lock in their returns. The continuation fund often gives a GP the opportunity to improve its returns by holding onto assets longer, giving the assets more time to grow and often additional capital to support that growth. And LPs believe that continuation funds are a game changer for the private equity ecosystem. They recognize that the rapid growth of continuation funds represent a significant evolution of private markets, an evolution whose implications are yet to be fully clear. On the pie chart on the left, the majority of private equity investors believe that the principal effect will be to strengthen the overall private markets ecosystem. But a sizable minority believe the change will be more profound, serving to undermine private equity's traditional 10-year fund model. On the pie chart on the right, two-thirds of LPs believe that continuation funds are likely to prove good owners for their portfolio companies, most likely as the GPs know the assets well. However, some LPs remain to be convinced one third saying that the companies in continuation funds might have had better prospects with different third party owners. If we turn to the wider secondaries market, you will see in the chart on the left, it's a market that has been developing in many strategies in recent years in response to the changing liquidity needs of investors. And almost all LPs expect that the secondary market in private equity will grow further in the next three years. Nearly half of investors foresee secondary market expansion in other key areas of private markets in the same period, for example, in credit, infrastructure, and real estate. Taking a look at the secondary's private credit market for a moment, it's a market that is showing rapid growth with a compound average growth rate of 45% from 2011 to 2020, according to market estimates. According to LPs, investors selling private credit assets in the next few years will have a wide variety of motivations. A desire for increased liquidity will be only one of several portfolio management needs, which also include locking in returns, rebalancing portfolios, refocusing on the best performing GPs and assets, and reducing exposure to underperforming assets. On balance though, LPs private credit investments are performing well, with their private credit assets outperforming rather than underperforming their target returns. This picture holds true across all the main types of private credit, though it is noticeably weaker for distress lending and special situations where almost the same percentage of LPs reported outperformance and underperformance compared with their target returns. I'll now hand over to Katrina to present the rest of the findings. Thank you, Lisa. Next, let's turn to co-investments. For many years, the barometer has reported a growth in the number of LPs making co-investments alongside their managers. With the competition for co-investment opportunities increasing, in this barometer, we asked LPs what steps they are taking to make themselves more attractive as co-investors. Over half of LPs reported they are changing their business practices to make themselves more attractive to GPs as co-investors. Almost all of this group are trying to increase their speed of decision-making. Other steps being taken by LPs range from building their expertise in particular areas of the market 
to being more willing to pay economics on co-investments. Almost all LPs that co-invest outside their core fund relationships are motivated to do so in order to boost their returns. This is not investors only motivation. Getting to know how individual GPs work and boosting exposure to specific areas of the market are also key drivers. ESG is a topic of growing importance within private markets. Although the importance of ESG differs based on the geographic location of investors. We asked LPs whether ESG factors have played a major role in rejecting a fund commitment and around a quarter of the North American LPs and a third of the Asian Pacific LPs reported they have done so. This stat has remained fairly stable over the last five years. However, the proportion of European LPs rejecting commitments on ESG grounds has grown significantly over the same period, from a third of investors in the barometer of winter 2016-17 to over half of European LPs today. European LPs are also more pessimistic about anti-greenwashing regulation than Asian Pacific and North American LPs. This is regulation brought to eradicate false or misleading environmental claims, mainly to prevent GPs from making false green marketing claims, which can be used to persuade investors that their funds are environmentally friendly. Two thirds of Asian Pacific LPs and well over half of North American LPs think that the new regulations will make it easier to distinguish true environment related claims from greenwashing in the next three years. While on the topic of regulation, we also sought investors' views on the increase in government regulation of private equity. Again, there was a regional difference, with half of North American LPs expecting more regulation of private equity in their domestic market in the next few years, compared to just a third of LPs in Europe and Asia Pacific. Overall, the majority of LPs across all regions do foresee an increase in PE regulation outside their home markets in the next few years. But there may be a scenario in which the private equity industry moves ahead of government regulation. With so much scrutiny of the private equity business model in numerous areas, ranging from fee and performance metric disclosures to side letters, three in five LPs believe that societal pressure will make it necessary for the private equity industry to self-regulate over the next few years. Changes in the private market landscape and how the industry is regulated were not the only trends LPs reported in the winter barometer. How LPs interact with GPs is also set to see more change in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic made certain changes necessary over the last 18 months, mainly around how investors carry out their due diligence checks on GPs before making a commitment with an increased reliance on technology i.e. virtual meetings displacing face-to-face -face meetings. A large proportion of LPs have made fund commitments in the last 18 months with general partners whom they've never met face-to-face. -face. Over a third of investors will continue to do so in the next 18 months. The proportion of LPs planning first-time commitments in the next 18 months after virtual-only diligence is highest of all in Asia Pacific, where 50% of LPs plan to keep doing business this way perhaps taking the view that international travel will have some level of restrictions for some time to come. Another area of technology and media that LPs are using more frequently in their diligence check is social media. LPs report that they are increasingly checking the social media accounts of individual GP team members, which is not surprising given the importance of reputation in the industry. Over two thirds of LPs are either already monitoring the social media accounts of individual members of GP teams or are likely to start doing so in the future. An increased reliance on technology brings its own issues. The chart here shows the importance of cybersecurity for private fund CFOs with more than half asking for live or daily cybersecurity updates. For LPs, the subject is also top of mind as cyber attacks on their own organizations have risen. Nearly a tenth of LP organizations have suffered a cybersecurity attack recently. That's double the amount four years ago as recorded in our summer 2017 barometer. 
and LPs are looking to the future with two-thirds expecting an attack at some point over the next five years. This is leading LPs to question their GPs more closely on the topic, with almost three-quarters of LPs saying they are likely to require cybersecurity risk assessments of their GPs management companies. Over half of LPs say they will require similar checks for the GPs portfolio companies. And lastly, we turn to Asia, a dynamic market where Asian private assets under management are forecasted to rise sharply by 2025, according to Prequin. We asked LPs how they are developing their plans for private market investment in the region. Of the two thirds of international LPs with current exposure to Asia Pacific private markets, excluding China, many plan to boost their exposure over the next three years, especially in buyout, venture, and infrastructure. That concludes our findings. In this barometer, investors are telling us incentivization of portfolio company employees is viewed as a positive for returns. Continuation funds are a game changer for the private equity ecosystem. More European LPs are rejecting commitments on ESG grounds than their peers. And virtual due diligence is here to stay. We will circulate this presentation tomorrow by email. Alternatively, reach out to any of the caller team and we will arrange to send you a copy. The Barometer is a publication of the Caller Research Institute. You can find more information about our reports on the research section of the Caller Capital website. There is also an option to subscribe to our research for future publications. That concludes our presentation. For those of you that have submitted questions, we will follow up shortly. Thank you very much for watching.